Psalm 1. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, or stand in the way of sinners, or sit in the seat of mockers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever he does prospers. Not so the wicked. They are like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Well, good morning. My name is Joe, and I have the privilege of being with you this morning. I'm on the leadership team here with River Valley Murphy Campus. So glad that you all are here. I see a lot of new faces, some some familiar faces, some friendly faces. And I'm just so excited to be with you today. Uh, some of you are not so friendly sometimes. I'm just not. Everyone looks friendly today. I'm glad. Um, Quick Bible trivia that starts you off, wake you up. You're like, this, we're not in a classroom, Joe. Well, close enough. We're in a cafeteria at a school. So, Bible trivia. Someone tell me the largest book. Name the largest book in the Bible. Psalms. Try again. Trick question. <laughs> largest book in the Bible by, not by chapter. So I'll give you that. Largest book in the Bible by chapter amount, yes. Largest book in the Bible by word count. Okay, my wife in the back. Isaiah? No, not even, not even the top three is Isaiah. Genesis is number two. Someone try number one. Let me give you a hint. My name's Joe. It starts with a J. This book starts with a J. Jeremiah. Someone's, ah, uh, uh, the teacher, Miss Becca said Jeremiah. Yes, Jeremiah, Genesis, and then Psalms. That was a trick question, sorry. <laughs> Psalms is on the screen and it wasn't even the answer. Uh, Psalms, a beautiful book of poetry, lament, anguish, heartache, joy, and praise. Uh, we find so many things in the book of Psalms, and I know for me, Psalms is a book I turn to, and, and I can turn to at any season of life, when I'm happy, when I'm sad, when I'm kind of feeling down and depressed, when I kind of feel like I'm in a funk, when I kind of feel like, man, I'm on top of the world. Psalms has a story, has a song, has a word for anybody in any season of life, and it's one of the most beautiful books in the Bible. A collection of songs, a collection of praises, a collection of, of different words. But someone tell me, again, Bible trivia, how many authors do you think wrote the book of Psalms? Let me, let me tell you, give you a hint, it's between one and ten. Two. So with, how, about, how about this? Show me with your fingers, so you have two hands, uh, or use one, how many authors do you think helped write the book of Psalms? Seven, four, that's funny, four, uh, seven, okay, six, seven, some of you cheated, I think, two, okay, uh, seven is the right answer, seven different authors wrote the book of Psalms, there are some that are, we don't know who wrote them, there's approximately 50, some scholars say, Psalms that have no author to them, and we're going to read one today, actually, we don't, we're not really sure maybe who wrote this, but they've been collected throughout history by the Jews mostly, and the early church as they put together this book that we call Psalms. Psalms is divided actually into five different books. So it's not just one book, it's really actually a collection of books, five to be exact, a huge book, 150 chapters. It's usually known as the biggest book in the Bible and most people think that David wrote all of them. Uh, both not true, uh, just a quick, just nope, seven different authors, it's pretty crazy. And actually Moses wrote one, isn't that crazy? Uh, I love the book of Psalms. I think many of you in this room sitting here, I can see your eyes light up as you're like, Psalms, yes, I love Psalms. I enjoy being in the Psalms. If you've been with us at River Valley, we've been going through God's space. And, and really briefly, God's space is this idea of creating natural, organic conversations with people and introducing them to Jesus and how to do that without being weird. <laughs> I don't know about you, but sometimes I come across as weird, get it, believe it or not. Uh, but how we all learn some, hopefully some tips, some suggestions as to how we can bring up Jesus and talk about our faith in just a natural way. In the culture, and the climate of the culture we live in that is a kind of against religion, against Christianity, how can we do that? But now we jump into a new series on the book of Psalms. Uh, if you have your Bible, turn with me to Psalms chapter 1. We're going to start right at the beginning, Psalms chapter 1. It will be on the screen. 
a beautiful psalm. Let's look at it together. Psalms chapter one, verse one. Blessed, blessed is the one who does not walk in the step with the wicked or stand in the way of, that, of the sinners or take the seat in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night. Verse three, that person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. Not so the wicked. They are like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to destruction. A beautiful psalm, very poetic, right? Almost like you, want to, you can like close your eyes and just listen to whoever the psalmist was, write that and just take in what he's saying. And it almost speaks for itself. But if you're taking notes, uh, blessed, the term blessed, the first word in the psalm, blessed is the man, I would say blessed equals happy. A very simple way to do it, I'm a simple-minded guy, I work with students and I work with young people and a lot of times we need simple words. So blessed equals happy. And today we're gonna be talking about what a happy person does and how to be happy. How many of you want to be happy? You, if you're not raising your hand, you're a liar. Everyone wants to be happy. And God wants you to be happy. I believe that. Happiness is something we all pursue. And our culture, though, in America, says do whatever it takes to be happy. And you can think of a list of things that the culture or America or the society or the internet tells you are ways you can be happy. If you Google how to be happy, like, I don't even know how many pages Google has, but I think it never ends for that one. How to be happy. You can type it into YouTube, and there's probably hundreds of thousands, if not millions of videos of people speaking, not by the authority of the word of God, but by their own idea of what it means to be happy. How to be happy. We all want to be happy. We all pursue happiness. That's a good thing. And I think God wants us to be happy. So blessed equals happy. We're going to look at three things. One, what a happy person discerns, how a happy person discerns. A happy person is a Bible delighter. I'm gonna come back to these. And a happy person remembers. Verse one, blessed is the man, happy is the man who does what? Does not do certain things. And I find this interesting as the psalmist goes in, blessed or happy is the one who does not walk in the step with the wicked or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the company of mockers. Point one, a happy person discerns. A happy person discerns. A happy person knows the difference of a healthy relationship and an unhealthy relationship. A happy person, a blessed person, I believe, values relationships and knows when to say no. So often I find in my life, and I speak from just experience, I am who I hang out with. I tell this to students all the time. You are who you hang out with. A happy person, a blessed person, the psalmist is saying, does not hang out with punks. <laughs> That's the simplest way to say it. Does not hang out with the wicked. Does not hang out with people who are, who are not following Jesus. Now you say, Joe, you just talked about God's space and we're supposed to reach people for Jesus, right? If the psalmist is saying don't hang out with them, how are we supposed to reach them? I don't understand. And I, I wrestled with this question, but then I came to the conclusion that the psalmist is not saying do not go and reach the lost. There's a difference between who you plant yourself with and the person you reach out to. Maybe another way to say that is a happy person understands the difference between who you plant yourself next to and who you reach out to. For instance, I have a friend doesn't know Jesus, doesn't claim Christ, doesn't want anything really to do with Bible, God. I don't know why we're really friends. I'm surprised, but I just keep being friends with this guy. I try to be, but this guy, he's kind of a tough dude to get along with. Pretty cursed language, pretty foul, a uh, little heavy on the drinking, likes to do things that maybe just aren't really great, ideal things for a father of three to be doing. Um, but I, I, I try to befriend him but I try not to let him influence me. You see, I think Jesus was a friend of sinners and he came out to change the world. Jesus came to change the world, right? But he didn't let the world change him. If we want to change the world and reach people for Jesus, it's okay to go out and change the world. Yes, befriend, go out to befriend sinners, but don't let the world change you. So a happy person discerns 
what a healthy relationship is and what a healthy relationship isn't. You are who you hang out with. Another thought I want to just throw out, I see some younger faces in the, in the crew today. You are who you follow and subscribe to. <laughs> you're like, no, nah, no, I'm serious. Like, if you're going to follow and subscribe, this isn't just for the young, I think this is for all of us. If you follow and subscribe people on social media, which everyone pretty much is on social media. In fact, our, our very own campus pastor is now on social media. Like Facebook, wow, welcome to the world, Brian. Where have you been? But... Um, some of you, I think I heard like multiple people go, did Brian get a Facebook or is this a spam? Like, I don't, like, is this normal? Like, I don't, and so, and there's Brian's beautiful face right there on Facebook. I love it. So a lot of us use social media. It is the platform, especially with young people, that is the platform they use to communicate. That is the way of socializing, social media. And I have found, I have so many friends, so many young adult friends who have turned away from Jesus for different reasons. But almost every one of them, the reoccurring theme is they follow and subscribe to people on YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, whatever their social media platform is. Facebook's kind of old school. Sorry, folks. But they're following and subscribing to different people who are not Jesus followers, who are in fact actually people who are trying to find themselves or are trying to have some better self-care in life. And they follow these people who have good, sound really nice and they have really good advice, and they're really friendly, and they make great videos, man. Joe, you should watch some, they tell me. And I, I try, but these, these, a lot of times, these people they're subscribing and following are not saying, follow Jesus. They're saying, just follow your heart. That's where happiness lies, is in your heart. And so the tide turns. And I have so many young adult friends who, yeah, I don't really need church, Joe. I don't really need Jesus too much. And I believe so often it is because of the influences they let into their ears and in front of their eyes. You are who you hang out with and you are who you subscribe to. So a happy person discerns. A happy person also has self-control. As we see in this verse, blessed is the man who does not, who chooses to say no to something. I love what Paul says that in Titus 2. For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. Wow, praise God. It's not on the screen, but verse 12 says, it teaches us to say no. It teaches us to say no. The grace of God teaches us to say no, but no to what? Paul goes on to say to ungodliness and worldly passions. And it gives us the authority and the power to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. The grace of God gives you the ability to say no. You don't have to just go with the flow. Just because all the fish are swimming that way down the path, down the river, you don't have to say, oh, I'm going to go with everybody. Oh, they're all watching. Everyone subscribe to this guy. I'm going to subscribe too. He's got 800,000 million, Julian, bajillion subscribers. I'm going to follow. I'm going to subscribe too. Oh, he's the new popular one. Oh, I'm gonna, oh she is so cool. Oh, did you see her videos? Or maybe it's that way in the workplace. Oh, man, the boss is so awesome. I love my boss. He's so amazing. Man, he just loves to party really hard on the weekends, but... I just love my boss so much and everyone else is hanging out with him. I want to hang out with him too. Like, he's so cool. Oh. By the grace of God, we are able to say, no, I, I don't, I'm okay. I'll pass. I don't need to follow. I don't need to be influenced by you. I don't need to walk along that same path. Verse two, a happy person, and point two, a happy person is a, I'm going to call him a Bible delighter. A Bible delighter. I made that up. I thought that was pretty cool. No one else smirked. I thought that was cool. Blessed is the one who does not do certain things. And then verse two goes on to say, blessed is that guy, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night. A blessed person is a Bible delighter. So often in my life, I find myself not very happy. Kind of goes alongside how much time I don't spend in the word. I find myself off-centered. I find myself kind of wishy-washy. I bet you do too. 
You can say, yeah, Joe, there's seasons of life where it's tough to get in the word. I'm busy. I'm stressed. There's a lot going on. I don't know where to fit in like my time with Jesus and spending time with him and meditating on his word and just praying with him and communing with him. It's hard sometimes to do that. And I'm sure you can say along with me, in those seasons of life, it feels like you just get, are getting tossed back and forth in the waves and you're just, uncon- you can't control it. It seems like everything's spinning and you're not sure what to do. But I find so much, though, in my life that when I am centered on Jesus, when I am meditating on the law of the Lord, or another way to say it is meditating on his word, meditating on scriptures, meditating on on psalms, meditating on what Paul says to the early church, meditating on on what Jesus says and does in, in, in the gospels, when I am putting that before me and letting that influence me and I'm soaking that up, I feel like I'm invincible, right? But beware of the religiosity, if that's a word, of reading the Bible. The religiosity, the, the I have to do it. Oh, friends, this is, this is scary. And I see so many people, I read my Bible. And I read four chapters today and I prayed for 20 minutes. And they walk away. Oh, yes, I, Joe, I, I, you, don't, you don't know. I'm in the Word every day. I am, I, I'm good. And there's almost this religious, like, self-righteous, like, oh, look at me. I, I read. I'm in the word, yeah. But do they delight? I love the word the psalmist uses. He delights in the law of the Lord. He doesn't just go, oh, yay, all right, coffee, breakfast, sit down, read my Bible. All right, cool, read five chapters, or I read four paragraphs or four words, cool. All right, I'm out. I read my Bible, check it off the list, on to the day. The psalmist is saying he delights he wants to do it. He, he wakes up early maybe before the sunrise and, and wants to, to read God's word, be, be communing with Jesus, talking with Jesus. Stays up late because it consumes him and he can't help himself. He wants more of him. As Paul would say, to know Christ, to know him. Not just to kind of get to know him in my head, but to experience him. I believe that's what the psalmist is saying. You will be happier Trust me, this isn't for me, this is the Bible speaking. You will be happier when you find yourself delighting in God's word, when you're a Bible delighter. And some of you, maybe that's the missing ingredient. Maybe you're thinking, man, Joe, life has been really going along, pretty ho-hum, and things are going pretty well these days. I just don't know what's missing. I just kind of don't feel happy. I kind of feel like I'm in a funk, like I'm in kind of depressed. I don't know. Let me ask, have you been in the word? Have you been delighting in his word? Spending time with him out of a joy, out of a a passion, out of a desire to know him more, to know Christ. Happy person is a Bible delighter. I love Paul in Colossians 2, verses 6 and 7. And now, just as you accepted Christ Jesus as your Lord, you must continue to follow him. Verse 7, let your roots grow down into him and let your lives be built on him. Then your faith will grow strong in the truth you were taught and you will overflow with thankfulness. Let your roots grow down. Get to know him. Sit in his presence. Don't rush through it. Take delight in him. Grow in Christ. That's what a happy person does. A truly happy person Point number three, a happy person remembers. A happy person remembers. Verses four and six go on to say this, not so the wicked, they are like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to destruction. Ooh, that's kind of scary. I don't want to be wicked. (laughs) That alone is like, oh man, I don't want to be like chaff. Yikes, I don't want to get blown away. And you might say, yeah, Joe, I'm not wicked. I'm not a wicked person. I'm I'm not that bad. I'm a pretty good guy. I have a lot of friends, a lot of young people believe still to this day, and it's still a very common misconception in our culture here in America, that if you're just good, if you're a good person, if you you do more good than bad, you'll end up in heaven. God will just say, yeah, you're a good guy. You, you don't deserve to be in hell. That's not true, my friends. In case you're wondering, it's not about what you do or don't do. It's about what you believe and who you believe in. By grace. 
But so often I see young people and people that I run circles with, they go, man, but Joe, it's not that big a deal. My friends, they just, they, you know, you know, yeah, I'm kind of missing church more. I'm kind of not in the word so much. And yeah, my friends, they're not encouraging me to do that either, but it's not a big deal. And we tolerate this idea that it's okay to just be influenced by the world and the wicked. I believe the Bible is very strong. Not so the wicked. Their future is dim. This idea of chaff, though, made me like go, like, what in the world is chaff? Like, what is that? Like, I don't know about you, but I don't deal with chaff every day. Like, that's just not my thing. But I did grow up out in Michigan. I grew up on farms. And we did do this thing where we would harvest corn about this time of year. And what would happen when we would harvest the corn, this big tractor thing with like these big old like looking forky things. Forky things? I don't know. It would like come through like a combine. That's the right word. My brothers will be happy. I remember the name. And, and it would chop up the corn and, and take it all into this processing. And it would like shoot it out this big old like cannon. I called it a cannon. It was just like a chute. And it would like dump it into a dump truck. It was pretty cool. Well, when it would like chew up all the corn, a lot of times it would leave behind all like the shell and things that were not needed for the silage it's called. We would feed the cows silage. Doesn't that sound tasty? Mmm, some silage for lunch. No. Um, but as it processed through, it left behind things. And that's kind of what chaff is. I researched and found out. Chaff is like the, the, the stuff you don't need. When you're harvesting grain and different things, they would kind of sh- shift and sift through all the different parts of the, of the grain. And as they kind of sifted through it, there was parts that they didn't want. And they didn't need, and it was usually maybe like fibery things. It could just been, it was kind of like rubbish, just garbage. Like, you just don't need this, it's throwaway, it's worth nothing. And I thought to myself, well, how can we compare chaff to living in Murphy today in America, where we're not driving combines, nor are we harvesting grain every day? And I thought about the leaves I was raking this week. How many of you are raking like 800 tons of leaves these days? Yeah, Marty and I were talking about this this week, and I brought up some leaves, um... A, a small collection, let me tell you, of the leaves I've touched the last couple of weeks. But I thought of the leaves and how the leaves this time of year, it hasn't rained in a while on them, so they're pretty dry. And sorry to the janitor, this might make a mess. But I was thinking about like, man, like the wicked are like chaff. The wicked are like these dry leaves. And follow, not following Jesus and following the cultural standards and the norms of this world kind of lead to just living a life that resembles dead, dry leaves. They used to be kind of pretty, maybe temporarily. They used to look kind of fun and kind of cool. But now they're just on the ground, dead. That one's kind of, oh, that one's gross. But life for them starts to get crumpled up. And we start to see more and more troubles. They think everything's good. Oh, yeah, I'm okay. I'm fine. And then pretty soon it starts to fall apart. And they don't know what to do. And... And it's just, it's not a big deal. I'm good. I got this. I'm fine. It's okay. I promise. I, I, it's all self-care. I'm good. I just, I don't need, I don't need Jesus. I don't need religion. I'm good. And it's just, oh, shoot. Did I make a mess? But I think so often that's what happens. But a happy person remembers. Remembers what? I think a happy person remembers that this is where they started from. This is... Before Christ, this is kind of like what we were like. Worthless chaff, worthless dead leaves. Ephesians 2. I love what Paul says in Ephesians 2. 2 verses 1 through the beginning of 2. Once you were dead because of your disobedience. Once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins. You used to live in sin just like the rest of the world. But now, but now, we're like a tree. Verse three, back in Psalms. But now when you find Christ, you are like a tree planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither, does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. There's a picture I think I found. Uh, Maybe Ryan will find it. And I I love this picture. I didn't take the picture. I'm not gonna claim I took the picture. I'm not that creative and cool. But, 
I've come across here in Oregon, I love Oregon since moving here, I've come across on some hikes, you come around a bend maybe, or you come into an open area, and you see this stream, maybe similar to this, or a river, and these beautiful green trees just sprouting out along the side of the riverbank. And it just catches you off guard, and you're just like, wow, the beauty, the majesty of that space. And God and the psalmist says, when you are in Christ, you are like that. You are like a tree that just can't be moved. Your leaf never withers. You'll produce fruit in season and out of season. You, you will be so content, so centered on him, that nothing can shake you. You will be truly happy. A happy person remembers, though, how they once were dead, but now are alive. Alive in Christ. As Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, you are a new creation. The old has gone. You're no longer just dead. You're no longer a zombie, maybe is a way to put it for your younger ones. You're now real. You're now alive. You have a purpose and a meaning. You can produce fruit. You can change the world. You're no longer just worthless chaff. Remember, friends, though. Remember Christ. So often in my life, again, I speak from this personal experience, that I forget Christ too often. I forget his death. I forget his suffering. I forget what he did for me on that cross. And when I tend to forget about Jesus, so easily I find myself in a not very happy state of mind. But when I wake up in the morning or I start my day off with my cup of coffee like I always have to do. You don't want to see me without that. But when I'm starting my day with that cup of coffee and I'm remembering, and I go before the Lord and say, Father, thank you for your sacrifice. Thank you for sending your son Jesus. Thank you for what he did for me on that cross. Thank you that I'm no longer dead. I'm no longer like these worthless leaves. Thank you, Father, for that. When I start my day off remembering, and I do feel like one of these trees, I feel like an evergreen. I feel like nothing can stop me. The situations of life, the hiccups, the the trials of life come, but it feels like I'm an immovable force, not because of who I am, but because of what he did and who I am in him. Don't forget, my friends. A happy person discerns, right? A happy person has self-control in that discernment. When to say no, who to say no to. You are who you hang out with and who you follow and subscribe to. A happy person remembers and a happy person is a Bible delighter. Friends, I hope that you find yourself this week, one week at a time, one day at a time, coming before the Lord and remembering, delighting in his word and knowing who to hang out with and when to hang out with people. Knowing who to subscribe to and who to follow. But I hope you're encouraged to know that you're not alone. One of the craziest things I'm finding as I work with people, especially young people growing up with social media, is the sense of loneliness. So often it's said to me, and maybe not even verbally, but you can just tell by the look in someone's eyes that they feel alone. They feel like no one understands. They feel maybe so connected by this thing, the phone, the social media, the internet, whatever. You may feel so connected, but yet so lonely. Let me tell you, my friends, you're not alone. You're like a tree planted by this river, but you're not the only tree planted by the river. Wherever you're going through, whatever season of life God has you in right now and you're struggling through maybe, you're not alone. There's a grove of trees next to you. Look at that, I love that scene. It's all the beautiful greenery trees. And this is a beautiful family of God that you, I'm so glad you're here. And I hope that if if you're new with us or if you've been joining us maybe somewhat recently, you'll continue to, to join us. Partner with us. Hang out with us. Follow Jesus with us. We're not perfect. You can tell I'm a punk. But join us as we remember together. Next week we're gonna partake in communion and really truly take time to remember. But as you prepare your heart for next week, Let me encourage you just to be a Bible delighter. Get in his word this week and you'll find yourself so much centered on him to know him. The happiness will just exude from you and you'll find that happiness you've been looking for.